And now to close our day and get us ready for the welcome reception, we come to one of the most popular sessions of the symposium, the lightning talks. Today you're going to hear about topics related to the changing map of risk, hazards, and finance from, ver from a few different perspectives. Your speakers range from graduate students to CEOs and everything in between. The one thing they have in common is they are passionate about their topics, and these presentations are often among the best you will see over these two days. Now I ask Dr. Chris Tucker to present our lightning talks. Chris? All right, so uh, for those of you who've never been here before, uh, this is the fun part. Um, and uh, we love to be supportive uh, for all of our lightning speakers. If you don't know how this works, uh, they get to talk for five minutes. Their slides are on auto advance. And um, when the slide moves, they've got to keep on going. So uh, you might see uh, some wobbles here and there. And uh, that's part of the fun. So uh, we want to just bring them all up and uh, bring the next one up, the next one up, the next one up. And then we're all going to meet outside uh, to uh, talk about it over some adult beverages. So first, I'd like uh, to bring up uh, Mr. Mike Yabla from Earth, uh, the Earth Genome. Stress testing the U.S. food system using digital twin model. Thank you for the introduction and uh, excited to be here with you all. Uh, I'm Mikey Abella. I'm a product manager at the Earth Genome and a fellow at Schmidt Futures. And I'll be talking about stress testing the U.S. food system using a digital twin model, which we have named the Food Twin. Uh, now, Earth Genome is a nonprofit which focuses on using AI, machine learning, and design to aid the planet. And the plot line is an Earth Genome initiative which is focused specifically on the intersection of food systems and climate change. Uh, we have the goal of creating a food, si a food system that's rooted in data and resilient in the face of climate change. And in order to advance that mission, we have created a bunch of different tools and stories uh, and visualizations towards that end. Uh, for example, we created a tool which allows the user to understand how the war in Ukraine has impacted the global grain supply. And we have also created a scrolly telling article which is focused on how the flooding in Pakistan in 2022 impacted that country's agricultural industry. But today I'm focused on our new tool called Food Twin. Uh, a digital twin model is exas ex exactly how it sounds. It's a representation of some kind of physical reality using a digital model. And our model was built using U.S. Department of Agriculture data on food production and consumption across the United States at the county level. So if you look here at Westchester County in the Food Twin UI, uh, you'll notice that consumption is slightly higher than average at 800 calories per person per day, but production per person in Westchester County is virtually zero calories a day. Uh, so it begs the question, where is the food for Westchester County coming from? Uh, of course, it's coming from all over the place. Uh, it's coming from across the country in some cases, and it's coming specifically from Arista County in Maine. Uh, and this shows a really different kind of county where the consumption is about the same as Westchester, but their production per person is around 19,000 calories a day, or enough to feed 24 people. And this trend persists across the entire country. Uh, so it might not be that surprising to you that your food is not primarily coming from your backyard, but it probably is more centralized than you, than you realize. Uh, in our model, actually only 5.5% of counties are responsible for half of the total calories that are consumed in the United States. And this is not equal across different crops crop types, of course. Uh, so you can see in these graphs here, we've bucketed the, cal the caloric production of different counties in the US. Uh, and the top graphs are showing the uh, proportion of the caloric supply coming from those buckets. For oats, there aren't really outliers. But for stone fruits, there's one singular county responsible for 5% of the total calories. Another kind of centralization that I want to call out is that there are relatively few counties that are producing a diversity of crops. And so those that are, like Kern County and California, are hugely important for the nutritional supply to a wide variety of counties in the US, which you can see here. Uh, so it really doesn't take a nationwide disaster to wreak havoc on the US food system. All it takes is a hyper-local disaster in one of these very influential counties. Uh, we saw the COVID-19 pandemic disrupt global supply chains. And going back centuries, we've seen how heat and drought in particular can impact food systems. And these are going to become more frequent and more intense going forward. So in our model, we looked back 30 years and created hypothetical heat and drought scenarios and tested how these would impact 25 different crops at the county level. 
We then found these maps, which show the impact on production for each of these crops at the county level. And then we surfaced these in the Food Twin UI in this way, which shows the intensity of these potential heat and drought scenarios. Uh, so you can zoom in and interact with this on the Food Twin UI yourself. Uh, one example that I'll show here is Kern County, California, which is one I mentioned before, and they experience about a 6% reduction in calories produced, uh, which amounts to billions of calories annually. Another kind of potential stressor uh, is sort of beyond the realm of weather, and that is just that infrastructure is really important to the uh, food distribution system. And we saw just this past June that this infrastructure is not as resilient as we would like when we witnessed I-95 collapse in Philadelphia. And in Food Twin, you can see how food moves along these road networks. So to sum up, we have a few counties that are producing tons of calories. We have a few counties that are producing a huge diversity of crops. And all of these counties are going to be stressed by climate change going forward. And I want to emphasize that the effects of this will be felt most acutely by the most vulnerable populations, which are already consuming less calories per person. So in summary, if you're going to take a picture of any slide, have it be this one. Uh, you can scan the QR code to interact with the tool which just launched, or you can visit food.theplotline.org. Uh, I put my contact information here, as well as my colleagues' contact information. Uh, and I'll be around. I'm excited to talk to people about these things or anything else. Uh, and thank you very much for listening to me today. All right, next up, Dr. Rita Ammer from University of Missouri-St. Louis, Sinking Shorelines, Assessing the Impact of Sea Level Rise on Coastal Communities and Infrastructure. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm talking about sinking shorelines and the impacts of sea level rise on coastal communities and infrastructure. As you all know, sea level is rising and it will continue to rise because of global warming, which resulted in uh, ice melting, glaciers melting, and also expansion of ocean as water warms. Since the 1880s, the sea level has risen nine inches, about 240 millimeters, at rate of 2.2 millimeter per year. Only in the last 30 years, from 1993, to present, sea level has risen 3.9 inch, about 100 millimeter at rate of 3.3 millimeter per year. This is the SSP graph, shows the five pathways for future sea level rise until 2100. If we take the middle course, the intermediate pathway, the sea level will rise three feet above its current level by 2100. If that happened, this is a GIS model shows how the U.S. coasts will be impacted by the sea level at three feet above its current level. All of these blue color areas will be submerged underwater. The, about 30 percent of U.S. population lives in coastal areas. So, how about the relative sea level rise? So sea level rise at 3.3, but some areas actually the sea level rise more than that because of the ground motion caused by subsidence. The subsidence occur because of fluid withdrawal like water, oil, and the gas. And if you looked at the previous uh, uh, image, the red arrows show where these locations uh, occurred. Uh, one of the hottest spot is the Mississippi River Delta in coastal Louisiana. The uh, uh, sea level rise and relative the subsidence, it's about nine millimeter per year. So what will happen actually, New Orleans area is now protected by levees, but Oh, by 2100, it will be as island in the Gulf water. What is the key impacts of continued sea level rise? It will include increasing the sea coastal, the coastal erosion and the coastal land loss, and most of the wetlands will be submerged underwater. 
If you look here at this GIS model by the USGS, it shows how the land changes in the coastal Louisiana from 1932 to 2016. All of the red colors show land loss since the 1930s and the activities of oil exploration and the subsidence increased and resulted in the land loss. By 2100, and uh, this actually model for uh, nine, two, uh, 2050. All of these red areas will be lost in the coastal Louisiana, which is one of the most changing areas in the, in the world. Other examples, the coastal areas also impacted by a storm surge and the uh, high tides because of the sea level. As you see here, these are uh, pictures from the Orange County in southeast Texas impacted by the uh, uh, Gulf water. Most of the houses was underwater from the Hurricane Harvey. My last slide about the mitigation and the adaptation strategies for sea level rise. So sea level rise is a global issue. So all countries need to work together, share knowledge and the technology and the resources to address this problem and reducing the greenhouse emissions by transitioning to clean energy sources. Also wetlands is important as a barrier and absorb the carbon dioxide. So we have to maintain it and also to maintain the coastal ecosystem. Thank you. Ms. Catherine Kahn from Rutgers University, funding equitable co-production in climate risk adaptation. Katie. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Kahn, and I'm a PhD student at Rutgers University in the geography department. Uh, today, I'm going to share some learnings uh, on innovative funding strategies to advance equity and climate adaptation through co-production. So in the next five minutes, I'll discuss the value of co-production and how funding organizations can drive these collaborative research projects. I will then highlight some experiences from a pilot small grant program led by the Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast, or CC Run, a NOAA Climate Adaptation Partnerships team. And finally, I'll share some challenges and recommendations for overcoming them. Co-production is a process by which producers, such as university researchers or government scientists, and users, such as frontline communities or policymakers, of knowledge and services form partnerships. Co-production has resulted in more usable knowledge for practitioners and frontline communities because they are involved in the creation of research questions, methods of inquiry, and dissemination of findings. Additionally, co-production allows for the development of diverse communities of practice for information sharing. Co-production may lead to the democratization of decision-making processes, build capacity for marginalized actors, especially in science and research, as well as challenge some extractive research tendencies. However, equitable partnerships require trust and take a significant amount of time and funding. Many grant programs, including those centered on adaptation to climate risk, are limited in scope. And when the funding expires, frontline communities can be left with little to show for the partnership reproducing some of the harms of extractive research projects. Funders are in a unique position to support robust co-production partnerships that advance equity and justice by promoting collaboration, ensuring partners have equal access to financial resources, and holding themselves accountable to commitments of equity. CC Run launched a small grants program in the urban corridor between Philadelphia and Boston. Uh, which funded four organizations to co-produce adaptation services with university researchers in their area. We incorporated co-production into our application process by connecting potential applicants with researchers before the application was due, while also keeping the application simple and straightforward to reduce the burden on grantees. During the grant period, we established a community of practice to encourage multi-directional learning and establish a cohesive network we're also aiming to transition from a traditional reporting process to a storytelling framework. We're happy to report that support from the CCR grant has led to incredible work in some of our grantee communities. In New Jersey, Groundwork Elizabeth has led tree planting events with the community to stem erosion in a local creek that saw tremendous flooding during Hurricane Ida. Graduate students at Rutgers University and researchers at the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center partnered with Groundwork Elizabeth to identify data needs and developed mapping tools to highlight flooding. 
During community events, Groundwork Elizabeth has uh, piloted a survey for residents to identify important assets within these flood zones. In Chelsea, Massachusetts, Green Roots is developing a vacant lot with heat-reducing infrastructure to demonstrate strategies to reduce health risks by, posed by urban heat. And their partnership with researchers at CC Run has led to additional grant funding to sustain this work. Lastly, our team worked with each grantee to learn about their data needs and compiled a database of relevant tools. We hosted a training session which led to robust conversation about data gaps and sw uh, swapping data strategies across teams. While our initial results are promising, we faced hurdles in our program to fostering equitable co-production relationships and aim to share our experiences with other funders to improve grant program design with both climate risk and equity in mind. First, the institutional systems we have in place to shift funding resources to community partners are inherently burdensome. Working with university and government funding systems to reimagine contracting requirements to offer organizations upfront funding, as well as ensuring their intellectual property rights is a key first step. Funders must also shift our mindset of what innovation looks like. We, this might not be providing funds for an infrastructure project or a new data model, but rather making funds available for something like childcare so our community partners can attend relevant meetings. Lastly, providing space and time to foster storytelling and develop information sharing network encourages the development of strong cross-sector coalitions, building multiple capacities for adaptation. We spend a lot of time as funders looking for ways to build capacity within frontline communities, but initial analysis of our small grants program at CC Run has encouraged us to flip the script and instead consider how we can build our own capacity to better support communities driving action. Thank you to the entire team at CC Run, some of whom are in the audience today, uh, for their contributions to this work and our program partners for their tireless efforts to confront climate risk and advance climate and environmental justice in their communities throughout the Northeast. Thanks. Mr. Asaf Evan Paz from ESRI, Geospatial Superpowers, Harnessing ESRI's Technology to Navigate the Climate Crisis. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Asaf Evan Paz. I'm, uh, an account executive from the imagery and remote sensing team at Esri, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm kind of humbled with all the smart people here. So I want to talk about something I call geospatial superpowers. I may be exaggerating, but it's really how you can use uh, specifically our technology, Esri's technology, to help, I mean, you know, I don't want to say navigate the climate, but really try to talk about the climate crisis and how people can understand what to do. Um, so I wanted you know, to, again, have something a bit more dramatic, and, and it's real about our kids. I mean, I have two kids, maybe people here have kids. What kind of you know, future and world are we wanting to, 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 to leave them, okay? Um, and so obviously I'm, I'm hoping you know, everyone chooses the, the right answer. We've been working a lot with a lot of different uh, uh, sources. Also the, the White House, uh, feel free to take a picture. This is a, a mouthful we call it CAMERA, or the Climate Mapping for Resilience and Adaptation. Uh, tool, and it's a great tool because it has a lot of information that people can understand, and especially local communities, in terms of the hazard that they're facing from uh, climate change. So it has all the different um, hazards or kind of the main uh, hazards um, that climate change can, 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 can include. Specifically here, we're seeing, uh, for example, flooding in, in New York and in the distant and, and near future how that will affect uh, people. So it's really a good tool for everyone to be aware of, and especially people who are not necessarily in the business. It's good that they are aware of this and, and know that it's something that can help them. Obviously, we also have m uh, multiple different ways to help uh, people tell the story, whether it's dashboards, story maps, uh, web apps. So uh, maybe you're familiar, maybe you're not. If not, I recommend that you at least reach out to us. Uh, we think there's a lot you can do. So obviously a lot of work is already being done. For example, this hurricane tracker just shows real time uh, data of, of hurricane tropical storms, help people just understand wh what's going on. And we had a lot of very good work, for example, with Old Dominion in Norfolk. Uh, they're doing, uh, looking at how to mitigate some of the climate change like uh, sea level and what that would mean for their specific area. This is with 3D, but obviously it can be done with all kinds of different uh, data sources. Um, it's really a lot of uh, cool work being done, and we recommend, you know, there's a lot more work, obviously, that needs to be done. We're here to, to help, okay? We've got a lot of tools that you can use and, and just, you know, reach out to us to, to, to see what we can do to, to help you. Uh, I, I want to kind of misquote something saying, 
it's not a village, it's really uh, the whole world that, that needs to, to work. And, and we really recommend you, again, reaching out to us and seeing how we can help you uh, with this mission. Thank you. Next is my favorite uh, Tom Fitzwater, uh, Mr. Tom Fitzwater from the U.S. Census Bureau, estimating populations at risk. Thank you, my favorite Chris Tucker. So hello, my name is Tom Fitzwater. I am chief of the Demographic and Economic Studies Branch in the International Program Center of the U.S. Census Bureau. In this presentation, I will share how we estimate populations internationally, including populations at risk. Some of the key motivations for our work are summarized in this report prepared by the National Research Council. A few experts, excerpts from this report are shown here. Worldwide, millions of people are displaced annually because of disasters or social upheaval. Reliable data on the number, characteristics, and locations of these populations can bolster humanitarian relief efforts and recovery programs. And ensuring these data are geographically referenced is essential. This report was written 16 years ago. While we live in a world of ever more abundant data, the need for reliable and geographically referenced population data remains. At the International Program Center, we aim to inform decision makers and people living and working in areas with populations at risk and to help our colleagues at other national statistical offices around the world produce high quality data about their populations. Our mission is to advance data-driven decision making through tools, capacity, strengthening, and data products for the global statistical community. Since the 1930s, the U.S. Census Bureau has worked with other national statistical offices to share our knowledge and strengthen local statistical capacity in census and survey operations and in the production of demographic, household, and socioeconomic statistics. In recent decades, we have increasingly worked with our colleagues in country to improve geospatial capacity as well, including in the use of GIS and remote sensing data to improve census and survey operations. As you can see on this map, much of our recent collaboration has been with our colleagues in Central and South America, Africa, Central and South, East, uh, South Asia, and Oceania. Censuses and surveys provide critical demographic, health, economic, and household indicators. However, these data sets present a snapshot in time. If you need data for the now, then you need population estimates. For countries besides the US, we use an in-house tool called the Demographic Analysis and Population Projection System, or DAPS, to produce population estimates to the present and projections into the future. DAPS is also available publicly on census.gov, and we train uh, local demographers in its use as well, and you can download it. Uh, these estimates and projections apply the cohort component method, whereby estimates of births, deaths, and net international migrates, mi migrants are applied each year from a base population in the past to the present to construct the estimates time series, and then we continue these trends into the future to construct, construct the projections time series. The Census Bureau's national level population estimates and projections are available on the international database at census.gov IDB. It is a mobile friendly website. The IDB includes population by age and sex and other key demographic indicators for 227 countries and areas with populations of 5,000 or more from the recent past forward to the year 2100. As countries release new census survey and vital statistics data, we evaluate and adjust those data and incorporate them into our estimates. Most of our effort is spent constructing the estimates series, and this process can be especially challenging for countries and areas with incomplete statistics. These areas often have the most populations at risk. Recently, we have started expanding the IDB to include population estimates for thousands of subnational areas. Our long-term goal is global coverage. These projects involve intensive data efforts by our demographers and our geographers, working in tandem to align geospatial data and population statistics. We also produce gridded population estimates to give data users greater insights into population distribution and to produce population estimates for custom geographic areas. Shown on the right is one of our recent projects about the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Zambia. We're also exploring methods for estimating population vulnerability and resilience to events like disaster and environmental change. In recent years, the US Census Bureau has released community resilience estimates of the United States to identify areas with households that have more vulnerability factors, such as poverty, crowding, disability, and access to services. The vulnerability framework used for these estimates is adapted from work by geographer Susan Cutter. For other countries, we rely on data from national statistical offices via sources such as the Integrated Public Use Microdata Sample, or IPMS, uh, the, and the Demographic and Health Surveys, or DHS program. On the right side of this slide is a recent case study in Madagascar, where we have an early approach applying this 
framework internationally. Moving forward, we aim to build toolkits so these methods can be adapted and localized by our colleagues at national statistical offices. So please visit our website at census.gov slash international programs or send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Annette Hubschel from the University of Cape Town, from pandemic to climate crisis, lessons for resilient responses. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm very really glad to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about an ongoing research project that I'm conducting with Professor Gore, Meredith Gore. She's sitting on your council. We're at the moment busy with a project that looks into pandemic, um, into the impact of the pandemic on the wildlife economy, economy in Southern Africa. Um, Southern Africa and the whole continent of Africa has gone through five waves of COVID-19. And there have been huge impacts um, on border society and, of course, the wildlife economy, which we're looking into. The puzzle that we're looking into um, in terms of our research is that we found that illegal market actors have bounced back much quicker than legal market sector actors. Um, and our question is, why is that? How is that possible? We're using a framework called Frictions and Flows that we've um, developed over the past few years to try and understand what um, restrictions um, have um, been placed onto the broader wildlife economy and how actors have bounced back. Um, we had in Southern Africa a lot of interesting restrictions during um, COVID-19, like in the US. Some countries had stricter um, um, lockdown um, uh, limitations on movement of people. Um, for example, um, what was of, way of lots of interest to us is that um, illegal market actors were very quick to um, use essential, market, um, essential permits to, to move around. Um, we're using for our study three countries in, in Southern Africa. One of them is Tanzania. You've just seen the slide. There were no restrictions on, uh, in terms of COVID-19 there. We're also using Zambia, which is middle of the road. So there were some limitations on movement. And then finally, the country where I'm from, South Africa, which had very, very strict lockdown um, 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 restrictions, such as you no know, alcohol was sold for certain periods of time. People really were not allowed to move. So that was quite interesting for illegal market actors. In terms of the species that we're looking at, um, so we decided, um, of course, it would be interesting to understand how charismatic megafauna is impacted. There's always interest in elephants and rhinos. But we're also looking at smaller, smaller um, plants and gritters. So just to give you an idea, elephants and rhino perching, for example, were impacted um, during, during the lockdown um, restrictions. So there was less perching um, during, during the initial lockdown in most of the countries. And what we also found is that uh, people came up with new strategies um, uh, for survival. So, for example, charcoal production became a new livelihood strategy. Um, okay, next. Um, rhino poaching, I mentioned already, um, we had an immense sort of um, uh, cut down in poaching during the very first lockdown in South Africa. But as soon as lockdown restrictions were lifted, it got um, uh, uh, rhino poaching increased again. And um, a small case study that I briefly want to mention is um, a small plant, succulents. So the trafficking of succulents increased massively during um, COVID-19 in South Africa. And what is quite interesting is that um, uh, a lot of people felt drawn to, to plants and uh, obviously animals during COVID-19. So there was a huge increase um, and uh, some, of, uh, some populations in Northern Cape of South Africa have been driven into functional extinction. You can see some graphics here on the confiscate, uh, confiscation data of the South African National Biodiversity Institute. So the um, impact was quite massive on ma many species of conophytums. Um, what we learned in our research is that um, uh, actors involved in this business though, managed to very quickly adapt. So um, essentially traders on the Asian side where the conophytums go to, we um, located local poachers uh, to assist them. So basically 
um, supply chains were shortened. Um, coming to the end of my presentation, um, what is quite interesting is that uh, we, the massive impact on regulations and enforcement, technology, um, risk and security considerations and morality that played a role. So we think that um, we can learn a lot from COVID-19 and what happened in the wildlife economy for future disasters, climate change resp responses, but also possibly future pandemics. Um, so watch the space and the research is still ongoing. Thank you. Dr. Hildegard Link from Aqualink Engineering, the IRA 2022 Energy Incentives, Water Demand, Climate Change and Economic Risk. Hi, I have to start by saying I do not work for the Biden administration. I'm here to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act of 2020, um, energy incentives associated with that. Oh. Can I just like carry this around with me? Um, and uh, water, water associated with that. Uh, so the inflation work, I'm gonna do a quick review of the Inflation Reduction Act and energy incentives, talk a little bit about um, regional water vulnerability. Uh, I'll talk to you about IRA water demand, uh, water and energy, um, and so on. So let's talk about the incentives um, in the IRA 2020. Um, IRA 2020 offers incentives for um, household um, heating, um, electrification, for um, <clears throat> low carbon fuels, uh, for some um, types of nuclear power generation, um, for electric vehicles, um, for low carbon um, airplane fuels and uh, <clears throat> the Inflation Reduction Act um, aims to shift U.S. towards cleaner energy um, alternatives and the full um, rollout raises questions of water. Let's look at um, IPCC sixth assessment projections uh, for climate. Come on, come on. Okay, so this slide shows you that uh, we are projecting increased temperatures across the U.S. with it getting um, hotter uh, more quickly in the south. Um, and this, the increasing temperature is high confidence. Here we're looking at increasing dryness across the southern part of the U.S. Uh, with projections of increasing precip precipitation across the northern part of the U.S. Um, so, in the arid west, um, we're expecting to have two um, climate impacts. Increased temperature, highly likely. Decreased precipitation, moderately likely. Um, so let's take a quick look at this. This is energy, uh, electricity use um, in New York State and Texas. We have increased electricity use in the summertime when it gets hot. Anybody shocked? No. Yes, but this shows us a pattern of what happens to electricity when it gets hot. This is a really interesting slide. If you look at it, you see at the bottom all of our incentivized IRA technologies, and you see that nuclear power uses um, a huge um, whopping two um, cubic meters per megawatt um, of, gener of electricity generated. This is a slide that shows us the relationship, beginnings of a relationship between the price of electricity and um, <clears throat> temperature. Uh, this is New York State. Um, in Texas, this uh, in indicator is much stronger. In New York State, there's not as much drought, so we don't see um, as much of a relationship between um, drought and electric prices. Um, the US Office of Control or Conser Currency notes that climate-related financial risks have the potential to affect the safety and soundness of banks through physical and transition risks. So let's connect the dots. IPCC assessment says it's gonna get hotter and drier in the south. Um, electric uh, consumption and pricing increases as it gets drier and hotter. Um, and we have energy incentives in the um, IRA. In Texas, um, where it is drier, um, it's possible that the IRA incentives will incentivize low and no, car no water um, energy generation that will actually stabilize um, potential um, electric market vulnerability. Whew. 
Um, U.S. regions with moderate confidence projections of precipitation um, decrease uh, <clears throat> have the highest wind and solar potential, and the IRA 2020 renewable energy incentives may have multiple benefits, reducing carbon emissions, reducing water stress um, in regions of evolving scarcity, and stabilizing water and electricity markets. Next, we have Dr. Daniel Osgood, lead scientist of the Financial Instruments Sector Team at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Go for it. All right. Oh, and it's also up here. Yeah, so I just wanted to say as I start that this is a horrible title. And taking a lead from the earlier speakers in the opening session, this is really about how we really need to put the decision at the center for action and we need to focus on millions of people and the justice of doing that as the world gets much more complicated. There we go. So climate change is really making us need to handle problems that are much larger scales with many more decision makers than we've ever been able to address before. So we need to find new ways to do that and we need to figure out how we can have the end beneficiaries be driving the solutions, the decisions that they make, not starting with the tools or starting with the maps, but actually making sure that we are starting with the question. And so the use case that I want to start with is insurance. This is the parametric insurance that was talked about earlier today, where you're making a model on a satellite for payouts to solve someone's problems. In this case, I'm talking about smallholder farmers in, Acu in Africa, where you have to find out what they cannot do to address their risks so that they can take, make investments to take advantage of adaptation to climate change and not be blocked by the risk. And when this thing started, this insurance uh, about a decade ago, everyone wanted us to scale it and thought no one would do it. And then it started scaling it and we started realizing that we were causing problems because we weren't getting it right. People were taking adaptation chances that did not add up, and they had risk that wasn't covered. So as it scaled from a few thousand people to millions of people, we realized we needed to have them driving their own decisions. And so we started doing things like having quantitative town halls, where it's not just asking people what their yields are or how much risk they face, but it's really have asking them about the parameters in the models that are designed to serve them. In, in Zambia, in just a couple weeks, they did town hall visits in a thousand villages covering the whole country. And with only a little bit of cleaning, you know, comparing neighboring villages and just making sure things made sense, we found that those farmers could design models on the satellite that address their risks at least as good as any model that anyone had ever made and better than yield assessments. The farmers themselves could do that. We need to make sure that at massive scales, we are doing these kinds of things because people who are the end beneficiaries, the people who experience the disasters, know the solutions better than we do. <laughs> Um, because they're the only ones who know what they can do. It's their decisions. These are tools that we are using so that the local designers, the people that are the elected representatives or the expect experts hired by their governments can use that information to make solutions using the farm information and being able to put it back out to the communities in ways where they can digest the solutions and understand them and make their own actions. In many cases, we've been using games where we say, guess what your neighbors or the satellites would say was the worst situation, this place or that place, this year or that year. That information can go directly into the models and you know, you could get a prize. In this case, um, it was a woman who was 16 playing with her grandmother who won the game and informed the model. We're using these also at national level disaster plans where these kinds of models are using forecasts to trigger actions based on decisions um, that have been made 
that select the forecast. So you cannot start with the forecast. You need to start with the decision and find out what forecasts are appropriate by looking at what has happened in the past, what you would have wanted to do. Because there's a, well, and then this is where I just got off the plane from. So this is a very strange experience. Um, in Senegal, we're working on having phone games with uh, NASA Severe where people could talk about when they're going to water bodies, uh, which ones are the better water bodies, where they use the satellite information, but they also, through the phone games and radio shows, they communicate where they're gonna go because the satellites don't know where people want to go and they need to coordinate, otherwise it will be too congested. In the US, we're studying things like this in terms of the decisions to evacuate during a disaster. And the screen is blank, so thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Daniel Sheehan, Solutions Architect with Amazon Web Services, not Amazon Prime, so don't complain to him about the package that wasn't delivered to you yesterday. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Danny Sheehan, formerly of uh, UBS as well as Jupiter Intelligence. I'm a Geospatial Solutions Architect at Amazon Web Services, worldwide public sector, serving our federal civilian departments and agencies, such as NOAA, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, USGS, DOI, and so on, as well as Amazon Sustainability Initiatives. I'll go through a solution overview, highlight uh, key wildfire smoke detection notification services, and then go through a demo. So here's the situation. Wildfires quickly destroy life and property. While methods of detection and notification exist, they are slow and often disconnected and involve a human in the loop. Wildfires can double in size and intensity every three to five minutes, so early detection and minimal response times are essential to help reduce and prevent catastrophic loss of life and property. The task is to use AIML object detection tools and services to detect evidence of wildfire incidents and use cloud notification services to quickly alert incident responders of the wildlife, or sorry, wildfire smoke detection event. I believe an ensemble approach with multiple detection methods such as fixed ground-based detection, as in this example, satellite, drone, and using infrared as well as the optical bands can drive faster and better detection. So here's the solution architecture, including remotely sensed data collection, fixed sensor on tower in this example, Amazon Kinesis video streams to capture video to images and place those images in Amazon S3 and object storage, and then Amazon Recognition Custom Label Machine Learning Model Service, and if wildfire evidence is detected, notification for fire response is generated as an alert and a map is sent via text through Amazon Simple Notification Service. The solution uses AWS Lambda for serverless compute and is event-driven. Here's an example GIF that shows recognition detecting wildfire smoke in a series of images. We see the bounding box and confidence scores of the recognition response. When that object is detected, it sends a text via Amazon Simple Notification Service, or SNS. And if I click on that long URL in my phone, I could see a map where I could see the location of a tower and possible wildfire smoke detection image, along with current weather conditions pulled in from an API. This solution has been published as an Amazon public sector blog post and reviewed and approved by our AIML team. Now let's talk specifically about some of the important cloud services used in this solution. So Amazon Kinesis Video Streams is used to securely stream media from sensor to storage to the captured views as images in Amazon S3 buckets. Amazon Recognition Custom Labels, you can extend recognition to identify objects more specifically to your application needs by providing labeled training data object boundaries as shown in the AWS console screenshot here and extend recognition service and improve your model to best suit your use case. The training and testing data source for this example use cases is from the HPREN system from UCSD. HPREN provides environment observing sensors which deliver real time data in the case of fixed tower imagery which has captured several wildfire events from the optical spectrum through its implementation. Amazon Simple Notification Service is a fully managed service that makes it easy to send notifications from the cloud to a receiver. Lastly, Amazon Location 
uh, service is, is a fully managed service that makes it easy for developers to add location functionality such as maps, geofences, and so on. So as illustrated in this animated GIF, at the application main page we have a list of cameras. Each camera is an S3 bucket. For this bucket, we're transported to Mount Wilson Observatory in, in uh, Angeles National Forest uh, in Pasadena, California, summer 2020. Each image is captured every 15 seconds or so and is sent up to the recognition custom label service uh, via an event, an S3 event trigger. So we're moments away from, from Ranch 2 Fire Smoke entering the video feed and being detected by our Wildfire Smoke Object Detection Recognition Custom Label Service. Let's take a quick look at the application uh, console, and here we can start to see a detection event um, in, in the console here. So we can see a confidence score, an event was detected. And so each frame with a positive detection is recorded, and a notification is sent to a first responder. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Happy to demonstrate this or have a follow-up chat. And, uh, take care. Thank you. And if you don't know what an S3 bucket is, pull them aside over an adult beverage. Dr. Annika Sood, a Disaster and Climate Risk Data Library Fellow at the World Bank Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, GFDRR, one of my favorite acronyms. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ankita. And in my capacity as an urban planner, I'm going to talk about potential pitfalls of GIS in urban planning, which is a micro level planning compared to regional level. So, um, as we all know that uh, earlier the map making process was, was a tedious task because it was completely dependent on uh, laborious human intervention. But uh, the advent of GIS um, revolutionized the spatial planning analytics, not only in terms of time taken to create maps, but also in, uh, in terms of visualization and also it provided the urban planners with various sophisticated analytical tools which were not earlier even thought of. So uh, this transition from manual map making to digital map making did not happen uh, gradually in India, but it was enforced in 2015 through Digital India program and it made it mandatory for cities to make GIS based master plans. So I will take you through a small example of a case in India where because due to this sudden imposition, the, uh, the development authorities were not ready and equipped to incorporate GIS in the master planning. So I will show you through example what kind of errors were made in the process. So this is the case of a city in north of India and uh, this city is uh, growing really fast. So there are three assumptions based uh, in the master plan solely based on the outcome of GIS. So first assumption is the alignment of the rivers. It was so the, uh, the rivers which were aligned using GIS, uh, the, uh, it was considered uh, the true alignment and it completely discarded the survey of India uh, map align, uh, river alignment. Another assumption was if a river was uh, not delineated in the GIS, so uh, that river was considered extinct. And another, if a new river formed in GIS outcome that was considered, a new river was formed in the area. So we recreated the process in GIS, and uh, this is the area with three rivers there. And uh, as you can see, when we are doing it on GIS, there comes a point when the GIS analyst has to give a value to the flow accumulation. So when we give a very less value to flow accumulation, the area usually, uh, the GIS outcome usually have a lot of rivers in the area. On the other hand, when the value of N is very large, the rivers are very less. And uh, therefore, it explains why some of the rivers were extinct in the GIS outcome or why some new rivers were formed in the GIS outcome, which is completely far from the true situation on the ground. Another similar error was happening also because the, uh, the delineation was being done using 30 meter resolution data. It is critical to know because this is the freely available data and authorities are mainly relying on this for a micro level planning. And coming to the third error of alignment, as you can see, based on Cartosat and SRTM DEM product, ne neither of the results are aligning with the actual river on ground. Another example is again, there is no alignment 
compared to the actual ground situation though this is true for basin level but at a micro level uh, urban planning this is uh, completely false so these three errors have happened and as a consequence when i did the time series analysis so it was found that the rivers which were not included in the master plan are completely getting extinct because it facilitated encroachment of these rivers and the indirect consequence of these river uh, extinction is a lot of urban flooding is happening in these cities now after the year 2018 or 19 onwards with each recurring rainfall so with this small example as we all know that master plans are considered to be determining the the future of cities so um, uh, with so um, we can see that uh, i hope with this one example i can further the dialogue on how master plans based on faulty data or analytics can be a recipe for increasing risk in the cities so with this i stop here and uh, you can be in touch and thank you so much miss isabel tingson also from world bank gfdrr disaster and climate risk data library fellow over to you. Hi. Um, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm very excited to uh, uh, present to you our work on mapping housing stock from drone images and street view photos for climate resilience in the Caribbean. So this work was done under the Digital Earth for Resilient Caribbean, which is a World Bank project done in collaboration with GFDRR Digital Earth Partnership. Um, so just a quick uh, background or context. Uh, the Caribbean is among the most climate vulnerable regions in the world due to the prevalence and intensity of extreme climate hazards. So for example, in 2017, uh, Category 5 Hurricane Maria destroyed around 90% of Dominica's housing stock, um, with losses and damages accumulating up upwards of 380 million US dollars in the housing sector alone. And this has spurred ambitious climate resilience programs across government agencies. Um, across the different countries. Um, in order for these programs to be successful, governments require comprehensive housing stock information. Unfortunately, this data is often limited, incomplete, inaccessible, or even completely non-existent, especially in many developing countries. And so at the Digital Earth uh, Partnership, we look towards AI and Earth observation to see if these emerging technologies can help fill in these critical exposure data gaps. So our goal essentially is to enhance local capacity to leverage AI and Earth observation for resilient infrastructure and housing operations. And we do this by leveraging different Earth observation data sets. Um, so let me see the next slide. Um, so different Earth observation data sets, such as very high resolution aerial images in the form of drone images or RGB orthophotos. We also use LiDAR data, building footprints, and street level images or street view photos taken using GoPro cameras mounted on cars. Um, so essentially our work involves um, taking these raw drone, drone images or uh, street level images um, and running it through um, computer vision models to extract meaningful information to generate um, uh, critical exposure data maps. We also, um, we, we also uh, uh, explore different data fusion techniques, such as combining RGB images and LiDAR data to see if this improves overall model performance. And essentially, our, our um, outputs are, uh, one, we have roof type classification maps, which classify buildings based on whether the rooftops are flat, uh, gable, meaning pitched on two sides to a central ridge. Um, hip, meaning pitched with three or more sides, um, or it has no roof. Um, we also uh, classify um, buildings based on roof material. So whether the buildings are made of concrete or cement, whether they are made of um, healthy metal, um, irregular metal, the meaning it has some form of rusting, patching, or damage. Um, whether it is uh, covered in blue tarpaulin, which is usually indicative of major damage, or whether it's com incomplete, meaning it's uh, either under construction or severely damaged or haphazard. And we were able to generate these maps, um, these exposure data layers across uh, different small island developing states, including St. Lucia, Grenada, and Dominica, with accuracies ranging from 87 to 92 percent um, across these different um, countries.
Um, and essentially, this allows us to conduct a rapid building damage assessment. Um, so for example, what you're seeing here are pre and post disaster classification maps um, in the context of Hurricane Maria. So before Hurricane Maria, you see a lot of these healthy metal buildings uh, denoted by green, which then turn into incomplete and blue tarpaulin, which are denoted um, by purple and blue. I also want to briefly discuss that we are currently exploring the use of street view um, images to extract street level um, building attributes such as um, building wall material, building condition, security, uh, completeness, et cetera. So we're doing this for a pilot area in Dominica in collaboration with Development Seed. So before I end, I do want to emphasize the importance of a responsible and inclusive approaches to AI for disaster risk reduction and recovery. And this involves um, building local capacity, developing local skills, co-creating geospatial data sets, and advocating for open source, open science, and open data through, for example, the Risk Data Library by GFDRR. Um, so thank you very much. Feel free to um, reach out to me through these uh, socials, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Dr. Katie Verlinden, Senior Scientist with Applied Ocean Sciences. Hi, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, as you introduced me, I'm a Senior Scientist with Applied Ocean Sciences, and we're gonna do a very quick deep dive um, into how we can leverage uh, some environmental data into quantifying risk and identifying um, environmental hazards uh, for marine operations. Uh, inclement weather is a major um, has major impacts for maritime operations, uh, with some estimates are that up to $3.5 billion uh, impacts on the shipping and transportation industry annually. Um, and with this work, we're hoping to decrease those impacts. Our initial study area that we're developing this tool over is the Gulf of Mexico, um, partly due to the breadth of maritime operations uh, that exist in the area, everything from fishing to large uh, cargo ships and ports um, to cruise lines and the oil rigs. Uh, you can see a shipping density map, um, and you can see those major shipping lines. And so uh, we're focusing on those different areas. And we've also looked uh, briefly at some uh, reported shipping accidents and how those map to visibility conditions have been reported. Uh, what impacts visibility at sea? Um, some things you might expect, fog and low clouds, of course, rain and snow, uh, smoke and smog with both terrestrial and marine um, origins, and of course, lighting conditions uh, that can uh, shined and blind pilots. So the environmental data that we're looking at uh, covers the breadth of atmospheric, oceanic, and bathymetric data. Um, in atmosphere, looking at everything from uh, how moisture and heat are moving across areas. Um, in the ocean, we're looking at wave heights and surface currents. Uh, ocean atmospheric data, we're looking at ensemble forecasts. So we have an initial condition that is slightly nudged, and we see um, at the forecast time how those end up um, and see a probability distribution of the environmental conditions at that time. Um, and in conjunction with the environmental data, we need to consider safety thresholds or what information um, and conditions are affecting uh, pilots and uh, mariners um, and their actions, um, whether it's influencing to go out to sea or perhaps um, slow down their speeds and whatnot. Um, as we said, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a, a wide range of uh, maritime operations and so we're focusing on kind of three categories to develop this with. Um, there's the recreational fishers and yachters, uh, harbor operations, which is everything from those big tanker ships to um, their tugs and the pilot boats, um, and also then those support boats, um, like search and rescue, um, various military uh, service, uh, sea tow, um, all of those smaller boats, and of course the supply ships um, that run out to the oil rigs. Um, and so uh, what we do is we combine um, the probability of an environmental condition with the severity or how much it will impact those different operations um, into a matrix, and we call it kind of our risk matrix. Um, and so if an event is going to highly affect, say there's a rain squall coming, um, a lot of boats are not gonna go out to sea or need to do a full stop. And if there's a very high probability of that, then we assign that um, a high risk code. Um, and we can kind of add all those together and how they um, influence uh, visibility. And when we plot those across the spatial domain, we can create something like this, which is our risk map, where uh, high risk areas you probably want to avoid um, if you can. Uh, and so we both have this graphical representation and also intend to make these text forecasts available. 
Um, of course, if we create a data product, we want to make sure there's um, some validity to it. So we have um, a whole suite of uh, observational data available in the Gulf of Mexico with the buoys um, that have quite a history there. Um, and then also we have all these accident reports um, across the area. Uh, as we continue to work on this, we want to expand um, not only to US waters, these are all um, sh ship density tracks, um, but also to global waters um, and consider the different environmental conditions that influence visibility in each of those locations um, and see how we can adapt it. Um, we also would like to develop our own fog model. Uh, fog is very much not a solved problem in atmospheric science as it turns out. Um, and this one's near and dear to my heart as an atmospheric scientist. Um, so I very much look forward to that part of this project as we move forward. Um, and then also we would like to make this product ultimate, ultimately compatible with a variety of different platforms. And so uh, this would be an idea of combining our risk map, which we saw previously, um, with some uh, ship routing software um, to work to take the most advantageous routes um, to improve safety, consider risk management, route planning, and fuel load forecasting among others. Um, and so, like I said, this is just one example of how we can leverage environmental data uh, to address hazards and quantifying risk in uh, the maritime operations. Thanks so much. And uh, as you're, I know you've been thinking about what your five minute lightning talk is going to be when you submit next year. So let's give another round of applause for everybody.